Likewise, the British East India Corporation was literally designed in order to subjugate the entire continent of India or the subcontinent uh, of India. And in fact, if you actually go and read the letters that were written during that time period, what you'll see is that those conquerors said, it's not enough that we conquer these people in the military sense, but they have existing institutions that are thriving and Therefore, we must not only conquer them militarily, but we must also destroy their existing institutions and make them de dependent upon proper British institutions. They knew that to really colonize somebody, you had to colonize not only their physical bodies, but you have to colonize somebody's mind. That's what it really means whenever you really get down to it. And I want to suggest to you, with sincerity, I believe that we in the United States of America are also colonized. Our minds are colonized on a daily basis by the flood of misinformation and misdirection that we get from the so-called mainstream media, what I'll call corporate media. We're constantly being bombarded with either half-truths or, or, or we're told a little part of the story. All you have to do is, is go to fairness and accuracy and reporting or or any of the other myriad uh, different sources, counterspin, you'll be able to see clearly and, and easily just how much we're subject to a very sophisticated propaganda machine in the United States of America. And of course, another of the early transnational corporations that I think that we should talk about is a little outfit known as the Africa Trading Company. Does anybody want to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? Slaves. You know, thank you. Because honestly, I think that whenever we say slaves and that just trips off of our head, mm -hmm. I say this with respect, I think that's an indication of how colonized we are. Mm -hmm. Because after all, was Africa just full of slaves? No. no, Africa was full of people. I mean, we can say they traded Africans, but I like to actually say people. Mm -hmm. And I say this, people basically just like me. And I say that clearly, coherently, with full understanding of my pigment. But I still say people just like me because you ask any scientist, you ask any biologist, and they will tell you, she or he will say, race does not exist. I mean, sure, they'll say skin pigment exists, hair color exists, even ethnicity exists. But no scientist will elevate that to a taxonomy, a classification. They would say that doesn't make any sense. But check this out, especially to the white folk. Race doesn't exist. But racism damn sure does. Right? And that's because if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. And here is the reason that I want to go down this particular avenue, and that's because I will submit to you my belief that just as the corporation was created during the age of empire, the construct of race as an idea gets created and propagated in order in the same basic time period in order to justify the idea of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that that the idea of race was created, you know, to 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 start slavery because the 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 the, the sad practice of humans enslaving one another preceded uh, the corporations, but it went something like this. Let's say that uh, George Ryder and I are, are in different tribes. There's a river separating us, and my tribe goes to war against George's tribe, and my tribe wins. By the way, why might my tribe win this war? Anybody? Superior technology. Superior technology? Any other reasons? Greater numbers. Greater numbers? Health. Uh, better health? These are all good suggestions, and given the very limited information I give you, you know that you're just guessing, right? Mm. So I'm going to tell you why my side wins, because I'm telling the story. <laughs> this is very important. We need to recognize that whoever is telling the story has incredible power over being able to frame the story and tell the story, so we should be thinking about that anytime that we're watching corporate media, listening to corporate radio. Except KPFT radio, we can hear the truth. Big <laughs> shout out to KPFT. So, George, unfortunately for you, I am telling the story. So my tribe my, will win this war. I put my spear up against George 
George's neck and I say, George, you're not my slave. Here's my question to you folks. What is the legal, philosophical, intellectual justification for David to enslave George? No. Nothing except the spear. Power. Power. No other reason whatsoever. The point I'm making is that the construct of race gets created specifically as an idea in order to justify the abomination, the foolishness, the depraved idea of enslaving an entire group of people for no other reason than pigment. That is a profound thing. And in fact, I would tell you that the interconnection between the, the transnational corporation, imperialism, and racism is inextricably linked. And I'll go one step further and tell you I'm not the first American to make that observation. Because one of the great American orators said the same thing. Of course, his most famous speech was, I have a dream. And that's a fantastic speech. I'm glad that he gave it. I'm glad that it gets told. But you know, next Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I hope instead people will tell the best speech he ever gave. I hope we'll hear on the radio the speech he delivered at the Riverside Church in Harlem known as Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam, where he talked about the fact that the United States of America was suffering from a spiritual and moral decay because we had not addressed what he called the triple evils of extreme materialism, racism, and militarism. You see, folks, those are still happening today, and I submit that the problem is we're still suffering from that social, moral, ethical decay because we have not come to terms with corporatism, militarism, or racism and recognize how inextricably linked they are. And I think that if we're going to actually get out of the mess that we're in, we need to actually understand just how deep the mess goes so that we can move forward. Make sense? Yes. Right on. So. Let's now jump, jump forward in our sort of uh, history story, because all I'm doing is telling a story. And the next question that I have is, let's jump start to the United States. How many original, uh, how many original colonies in the United States? Thirteen. That was a gimme, y'all. And by the way, they were colonies, colonialism. That might be important. But now I'll ask the real question. How many of those thirteen colonies were actually corporations? Thirteen. It was a trick question. Don Cook got it right. That's right. Thirteen of them were actually corporations. Because, you see, the king had to create them. The king had to give body to them. Well, some people might say, nuh-uh, Massachusetts was already there. But that's why it's a trick question. Massachusetts wasn't there. The land was there. The people who lived on the land, the forest and the rivers and the fish and the deer and the birds, you know, reality was there. But it took the king to create Massachusetts. And the king created Massachusetts by use of a corporate charter. In fact, the corporate charter that came from the king created Massachusetts. Now, this corporate charter that we're talking about, that the king used to create Massachusetts, the king did not create the state of Massachusetts. Do you know what the king actually created? Commonwealth. Not the Commonwealth. That was also another trick question. <laughs> the king actually created the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony. It was, the charter was actually the creation of a joint stock company. Likewise, the king did not actually create the state of Virginia. The king literally created the Virginia Company. Most of the first colonies that were used to colonize the United States were for-profit joint stock companies. And in so creating it, the king in that original charter, for Massachusetts specifically, I'll, I'll quote it directly, the king said, I am now bringing into being and creating and defining this political boundary to be known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony. And now I will assign, now George, it's going to be good to sit where you're sitting because uh, in this illustration, I'll be the king. Why might I be the king? I'm telling the story. That's a guy. This, this guy's paying attention. I like that. So I am telling the story. I'll be the king. George, good for you. I'm going to make you a governor. Because as creating the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony, I say, I will now assign to George the authority to govern 
plant and rule Massachusetts in my name to benefit me and the shareholders of the joint stock company. So when we think of the Massachusetts governor appointed by the king back in the 1600s, there's another word that we might think of today. What word might we think of? CEO. CEO, a chief executive officer. And I say that very clearly because I want us to recognize and understand that in a very real way, the American Revolution is not only a rejection of monarchy as a form of rule. It's not only a rejection of the divine right of kings. It can also properly be understood as a people's uprising against corporate rule, against the royal governors or the CEOs of their day. Because, you know, I used to say the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. So maybe today we should do more than just call for more socially responsible corporations. I don't know about you, but I get sick and tired of feeling like a lot of the activist energy in this country is used to prove how awful the corporations are so that we can then go beg them to please not be quite so horrific. Oh, please, mighty corporation, we are proving to you that your actions are actually uh, causing asthma all along the corridor where you exist. Would you please not do that? Oh, mighty corporation, look at all the cancer clusters. Would you please not kill quite so many of the children who live near you? Oh, mighty corporation, would you please not kill quite so many coal miners in West Virginia? Oh, mighty corporation, would you please not destroy the entire freaking Gulf of Mexico ecosystem? Right? I don't know about you, but I want more than just a little less death. A little less destruction. That's not really what we want, is it? Can't we raise our aspirations as a people a little higher? Can't we actually be for what we're for? And I want to tell you something. I think it's also important to recognize that the American revolutionaries, those people who would become revolutionaries, they went through a process. Because actually, in the 1750s, they were writing letters to the king that went something like this. Oh, dear Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee, and we beg your intervention because, you see, your royal governor is passing unfair trade laws, not just taxation with re uh, representation, but passing laws that are unfair for business. And we need your intervention, oh, wise and great one. Please will you intervene on our behalf. It was the most sniveling, groveling language that you can imagine. And I don't know about you, but I am keenly interested in trying to understand what kind of conversations those people were having with one another that allowed them to stop the boot kissing, hmm. that convinced them that they could actually stand up, and as King would say at a different Amer point in American history, to find some steel for their backbone and put their shoulders back put their chin up and look directly at the king and where did the king claim cultural authority? God and see behind the king the most powerful military the world had ever seen and said you're done get out because let me tell you something folks that process is power that process is something that I can only call and I mean it sincerely self-respect the idea that you could actually stand up to culture, to history, to everything that you had been taught must be true, and to actually say, no, we can actually do this differently. <laughs> to go through that process, folks, is something that is honestly, it's, it, it's, it's almost spiritual in the sense of how wondrous that is. Because let me tell you something, it takes a very rare individual to do that completely alone. And even if you are able to do it completely alone, you will lose. The only way you can do that and have any chance to, at success is, is, is if a person to your right and your left is standing up with you. Because you see, if you begin a process of shifting culture, if enough people are having that conversation and they actually believe it, something very powerful can happen. And that special something is the recipe for movements. And it's what has happened throughout all of not only American history, but world history. When enough people begin to think differently and act differently, a different world emerges. And that's what I think that we ought to be committing ourselves to today, because a different world is desperately needed.